Uh, next week, I, I think you probably know, is daylight savings time. Is everybody aware of this? It, make sure you do that or you'll be really disoriented. Um, I think it's funny when we have moments like that, New Year's Day and uh, daylight savings time, and we're all kind of doing some, we expect some big changes. And a lot of times, though, it doesn't really change that much. The whole idea of day, daylight savings time is you lose less energy, you use less energy, and you get to go outside more and enjoy the sunlight more. That doesn't really happen just because you change your clocks. You guys realize that, right? That, that requires some daily choices of actually turning the thermostat down and actually going outside. You actually have to change. You have to make some daily choices. And that's just kind of how life works. Let me ask you a question really quick. Do you love life? I hope so. But if I'm totally honest with myself, uh, sometimes you say that, uh, hey, I love this more than life itself. There have been moments in my life where that's not a very big compliment. There have been moments in my life where I don't love life. And I don't think I'm the only person here that has felt that way. There have been other moments where just the, the pleasure of being with other people, being out in God's creation, getting to experience the things that he's given us is just overwhelmingly great. But somewhere in between those extremes and somewhere in the more subtle versions of those two extremes that are most of our daily, actual ex daily experience, the difference that I've found in my own life, at least, is it comes out of some choices that I make. It's, it's not so much that life is so terrible over here or so great over here. It has more to do with how surrendered I am to God and the daily ways that I am choosing to live life, whether I love it or not. And the biggest thing, the biggest choice that's ever affected me is the big time that I gave my life to Christ and the daily rebooting of giving him my life again every single day. I know a lot of you know what I'm talking about. But that daily process of rebooting, it's kind of like a computer. Uh, I don't know if you guys, uh, those of you who are parents, if your kids grew up with this, maybe some of you, especially in this section over there, maybe you grew up watching a cartoon called Reboot. Did anybody watch this one? Anybody, does this look familiar? My boys used to watch this. It wasn't my favorite. It was, it was pretty fun, but it struck me funny because the whole point was these characters were supposed to be computer programs, and they're always trying to save this computer. And, and so all these viruses would come and attack them, and they'd have all these adventures trying to save this computer. But the show was called Reboot. I don't know if you know as much as I know about computers, but here's all I know. You can shut them off and turn them back on, and it's almost magic. And every time I saw them watching this cartoon, I was like, y'all wouldn't even have a job if you just shut the computer down and turn it back on again. Y'all don't need to fight the virus, just reboot. Are you with me? Whoever thought that up, making computers built that way, I don't know how they do it, I don't know how it works, but they're a genius, and I really appreciate that. But here's the thing, here's the truth. Jesus reboots us. And that is the hope that we have. Jesus can actually shut stuff down in us that is just messed up, that we can't fix. We keep trying to tweak it. We keep trying to address it. We keep trying to confess it and repent. We keep trying to fix things. We keep trying our best to try and mess with it, mess with it. But the only real solution is Jesus actually rebooting us from scratch and also on a daily basis. That's what we're talking about today. I mean, Jesus actually rebooted everything from scratch. The whole Bible ties together amazingly well. 66 books written by over 40 different authors over the span of over 1,500 years. And yet it all ties together and tells the same story in truly, genuinely miraculous ways. Unbelievable. But the Old Testament, as you probably know, is mostly about rules. It paints pictures of what God wants us to to live like what justice and fairness and truth looks like, what God looks like. It paints those pictures with rules. These are good, these are bad. This is what you should do. This is what you should not do. But in the New Testament, Jesus took this whole thing to the way next level, and he, he told the same stories about God, the same stories about what God wanted us to be like, and yet it's all about transformation. Instead of coloring inside the lines, instead of coloring by numbers, he's teaching us to paint the way God paints. He actually changes us. He helps us see the world differently. He shuts down for a second. We just, okay, I, I, I can't do this. But with your help, 
You can. How many know that every time you have to update your computer, you have to let it reboot? You can't just get the update without stopping and starting over again. And this is what has to happen. Not only one major time in your life at least, but over and over as needed. This is how it happens. For most of us, it's daily. Well, let's talk about the Pharisees for a second. The Pharisees always get a really bad rap, don't they? And they're the villains of the gospel story. And, and well-deserved. They're the ones who got Jesus killed. They were pretty corrupt. They were hypocritical. There's a bad, bunch of bad things about the Pharisees. But let, let me tell you their heart just trying to be kind. What they, were, they were trying to follow Jesus. Not Jesus. They were trying to follow God. Sorry, that was the opposite of the truth. Try this one more time. They were trying to follow God. They were just wrong. They really believed that following the rules was the way to get eternal life and that that, that was all God wanted. They really believed that just doing the right things, not doing the bad things, that was all there was. And if they did that, they would get eternal life. They really believed that was the whole thing. But they, they were wrong. And when they got a chance to literally stare God in the eyes, they missed him. They killed him. But again, they had a heart to try and get it right. They wanted to. And one guy, Nicodemus, came to Jesus in the middle of the night. How many have heard this story before? You've heard about Nicodemus? I'm going to read some of it to you straight out of the scriptures this morning. John 3. There was a man named Nicodemus, a Jewish religious leader who was a Pharisee. And after a dark one evening, he came to speak with Jesus. Rabbi, he said, we all know that God has sent you to teach us. Your miraculous signs are evidence that God is with you. This is early in his ministry, but they knew enough scripture. They knew enough about God that they knew that the stuff Jesus was doing were clues that this was the Messiah. And at this point, he's actually banking on that. At this point, he's keeping it secret because he know he might get in trouble. But he's, he's actually going, I, we've been watching for this. The stuff you're doing is the stuff we're watching for. So enlighten me. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. Unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. What do you mean, exclaimed Nicodemus? How can an old man go back in his mother's womb and be born again? Jesus replied, I assure you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of the water and the spirit. Jesus is doing a couple things here. One is, he's given him this first clue. It's one of the first times Jesus starts explaining this idea that he wants to completely reboot everything. In, not only in how we relate to God, but just how we live our lives. He wants to actually transform us. We are starting over. We get a do-over. We get a mulligan. We get to do it again. We are born again is the words that Jesus used. What an amazing concept. But he's using some familiar language to Nicodemus. For example, when he says, born of the water, instantly somebody who was a scholar of the Old Testament would instantly be taken back to the, all the stories where God used water as a metaphor and a, a tool for transforming people. This happened all throughout Scripture. The flood, God used water as judgment, but also saved his people on a boat on top of that water. He brought his people through the Red Sea to save them. On one side of the water, they're slaves. On the other, they're free. When they finally get through all that they had to get through to get to the promised land and claim it, they pass through the Jordan River. And on one side, they're wandering around a homeless nation. On the other side of this water, they are home. God is keeping his promise. It, it, so uh, this is all, all these images have got to be playing in Nicodemus' mind because he knows what water means in the Old Testament. He's a Bible scholar. And also Jesus said, you've got to be warned of the spirit. So guaranteed he's thinking about even before God started the clock and started creating everything. And Genesis 1.1, the first thing it says, in the beginning was the word. I'm sorry, that's John's version of it. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God hovered above the waters. And then God said, let there be light. There's already something happening there. We don't know what it is, but the Spirit from day one literally is taking chaos and darkness and turning it into light 
and order. The spirit, being born in the spirit to Nicodemus has to be, that there, there, it's got to be tied into this. And he's got to also be remembering about the spirit of the Lord coming upon people time and time again throughout the Old Testament. People that were really great people, people that weren't, like Samson, for example. But the spirit of God would come upon them and empower them, and they were able to do stuff that human beings normally could not do. So when Jesus says, you must be born of the water and the spirit, but you're born again. He's bringing this brand new idea of complete transformation, but he's framing it within stuff he, oh yeah, God's actually always been about transformation. God's actually always been about empowering people to do things they can't do on their own. Okay. You guys tracking? Is this this making some sense, I hope? I hope so. Say this out loud with me. This is the truth. We must be born again. Say it one more time like you mean it. We must be born again. We must start over. We've got to recommit. We've got to repent. We've got to reboot. One of the times that God rebooted his people was in the Old Testament. It's in Numbers chapter 21. One of the weirdest stories. But these guys were always whining, always complaining, always rebelling, always trying to abandon God and all of his leaders and do something else. And one of the times to judge them and to change them and to punish them, God sends a bunch of poisonous snakes. It's one of my favorite crazy stories in the Bible. So here comes all these poisonous snakes and they're biting everybody and everybody's just dying right and left. And so they come running to Moses and they go, please save us. Oh, pray to God, somehow save us. Can you please save us? So he prays to God and God does, God could have done anything. He could have just said, okay, fine. The snakes are gone, right? He could have said, here comes eagles and they come and steal the snake. You know what? He could have done anything. Here's what he did. He said, "Um, Moses, I need you to make... A bronze snake, little sculpture. Put it on a stick and hold it up. Everybody who looks at this snake will be healed. Whoever doesn't look at the snake will not be healed. Now, he couldn't have had too much time. Because I don't know about y'all, but in a high tense situation, a high stress situation when everybody's tense... uh, There's a lot of backseat drivers. Are you with me? How many know what I'm talking about? So you know that Moses is trying to make this snake out of bronze. And you know everybody's going, Will you hurry up? It doesn't need all the scales for crying out loud. It just needs to be something that wraps around the stick, Moses. Just come on. You know? You know that this? it couldn't have looked that great. That's why I didn't spend much time. This is an old copper pipe. And the point was not the snake. The point was not the snake. It wasn't how good of a sculpture Moses was or anything to do with any of this. It was just that he was being obedient to God. But something amazing happened when he held up that probably really crude, lame little sculpture of a snake. Whoever looked at that got healed. And whoever said, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard, died. (laughs) That's how it works. Because it's not about the snake, it's about God. It's about his power to reboot us. And let me tell you something. At least for a couple of days, a couple of weeks, they didn't whine very much. Jesus continued, Humans can reproduce only human life, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. So don't be surprised when I say, You must be born again. And as Moses lifted up the bronze snake on a pole in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in Him will have eternal life. For this is how God loved the world. He gave His one and only Son, so that that everyone who believes in Him will not perish, but have eternal life. God sent His Son into the world, not to judge the world, but to save the world through Him. There is no judgment against anyone who believes in him, but anyone who does not believe in him has already been judged for not believing in God's one and only son. Now, as Nicodemus listened to this, he was guaranteed so familiar with this story, so familiar with these images, and yet he's got to just be blown away by this new concept of actually being born 
again. Real transformation. Not just, okay, fine, I'll look at the snake. But actually being changed. Actually starting to see things from God's own perspective. That had to have absolutely blown his mind. And it needs to blow our mind as well. Because when we hear the same words that Jesus uses there, we, th- we always hear it from our own perspective. We always hear everything from our own perspective. If I was to say to you that today, how's your love life? Most of you would probably start thinking something along the lines of, well, I, I don't know, how, do I have a romantic relationship that's satisfying to me? Do I? That's what our culture teaches us to do. But if Jesus asked you, how's your love life? He would be asking how you show love to others. He turns the whole thing over. It's not about are your needs being met. It's about are you living a life of love, a love life, the way he lived it. The way he can transform you so that you can be the kind of person who can live life that way. Would you say this out loud with me? We must love as Jesus loves us. One more time. We must love as Jesus loves us. Let me tell you some bad news and some good news really quick. Here's the bad news. We can't. Nobody can love like Jesus loves us. You can't do this. Here's the good news. You can with his help. He can download something into you and then reboot you so that you actually can He can put his Holy Spirit into you and then you can. And that is the hope of the gospel. He gives us the power to do what he asks us to do. I love that Jesus accepts absolutely every single person. I I saw a comedian recently on YouTube. It's a... um, Anyhow, it, it, he cracked me up. He was talking and, and he just, he shared, he said something about his wife. He was complaining about his wife, which I'm not sure that was cool. And I'm not sure she appreciated it. But he was making fun of himself. And he said he, he was telling himself in that moment when he was so frustrated, he told himself, hey, it's your fault. Out of all the women in the world, you chose this one. And then everybody was kind of awkward like you were right this minute. And, and he goes, that is very arrogant, isn't it? He goes, I actually didn't have my choice of everybody in the world, all the women in the world, just a very small group of women in the world who might be interested in me. And I chose her out of that group. I I thought that was funny. Apparently you don't, but that's okay. (laughs) But here's the thing. Here's the thing. Jesus invites everybody... Literally the whole world. He died for the whole world. But you know who gets to get rebooted? The people who believe in him. The people who actually accept the offer. The people who actually go, I can't do that. But if you seriously will help me, I will try. If you will reboot me, I'm on board. Let's try this thing. Those are the people who experience salvation. Those are the people who experience getting rebooted. It's the people that actually believe in him put their trust in him the people who can believe in him the way those people believed in that bronze snake not the snake so much that's the only difference it really is about Jesus it went about the snake but the thing was are you going to accept it or not are you going to believe it or not are you going to be obedient or not and those of us who choose to say yes we get to experience something that we literally could never do on our own nobody else in the world could do but anybody in the world could with Jesus' help. You're still tracking? Here's another amazing thing. Jesus, even in his lifetime, was so deliberate about reaching out beyond the borders of people, the people of God, reaching out to people. Another one of my favorite stories, again, this is John 4, one chapter later. First he's talking to the experts of Jewish law, and now he's talking to probably as far away as you could get. He's talking to a Samaritan woman. She doesn't know that much about the Bible. They're male. She's female. They, they're all self-righteous. She's really broken, if you know this story. Really feels bad about herself. And everybody in town probably feels really about, bad about her as well. But Jesus gives her the same invitation that he gave to Nicodemus. Jesus gives her the exact same message. Watch what happens. 
He tells her, he asks her for a drink. She freaks out. She's like, you're a guy, you're a Jew, you're in my territory. What are you doing? I can't believe this is happening. Are you serious? And he says, if you only knew the gift God has for you and who you are speaking to, you would ask me and I would give you living water. Once again, he's using that imagery and freaking her out at the same time. And she pushes back. Have you ever noticed that when somebody tries to help us, even if it's God, most of us, our first inclination is to push back? Somebody says, hey, I could help you with that. I don't need any help. I don't know why that is, but that's human nature. She says, sir, you don't even have a rope or a bucket. And this well is very deep. Where would you get this living water? And besides, do you think you're greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us this well? How can you offer better water than he and his sons and his animals enjoyed? Watch, here comes the water and the spirit again. Jesus replied, anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again. But those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh bubbling spring within them giving them eternal life. Again, he's talking about something brand new here. Not just you go where the temple is, you go where the well is. He comes inside of you. Wherever you are is now the new site of the living water. That's revolutionary. But the time is coming, Jesus said. Indeed, it's here now when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Let me stop there for a second. He's responding to something else she does. Remember, we always push back. We always push back. So instantly, he starts telling her something, and she goes, hold on just a minute. And she has this big theological question about worship. The time is coming, Jesus says. Indeed, it's here now when true worshipers will worship the Spirit in, worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship him in that way. For God is spirit, so those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. One chapter later, totally different, totally different environment, totally different person, totally different background, same ideas. Complete rebirth, complete restarting, complete rebooting, and there's water and the spirit. This lady accepts it. We actually really don't know that much about what Nicodemus did. There's some clues. You see him later on in the story. He did follow Jesus, but he didn't like do anything really dramatic. This lady that day goes back, gets her entire town. That day she believes that Jesus is the Messiah. That day everything changes. That day her life changes. Her reputation changes. She goes from being that lady who had five husbands and then lived with a sixth guy for a while to being the person who introduced us to the Messiah. In one day, her community is changed. The disciples are changed. Their perspective is changed. Everything changes in one day because Jesus has the power to reboot people like And we all need rebooted. Let's be honest. We all need that. Especially because we all, like Nicodemus and like this lady, we all come from our own perspective. The things we've thought, the things we've been taught, the things we've been experienced, the things that somebody has educated us about or shoved down our throat in whatever way, advertisements, all the stuff that gets crammed into our hearts and our brains as we go through life we always approach everything every other person and God himself from those perspectives and we're always just a little bit wrong aren't we because there's only one absolute truth we're all coming to that we all need some help we need to be able to change and especially this morning as we start to turn a corner and start to wrap up here I want I want to challenge you but this is especially true about love See, love to our culture today is all about us. It's all about getting our needs met. For example, I saw this the other day. Find someone who looks at you like Elon Musk looks at his rockets. <laughs> I, I get the appeal. That, that would be nice. I'd love to have Kim look at me with that big of a smile. That's nice. That's really cool. Or how about this one? Find someone who looks at you like a dog looks at food. <laughs> and it's not entirely 
not true. It's not entirely a bad thing. That would that, that, be great. But the truth is, that's not really love. And that kind of, those longing looks just kind of come and go, don't they? From other people looking at us and us looking at them. That can't be the whole thing. Some of us go overboard the other way. Some of us just try to love people all the time. And we're always looking for that feedback. Am I loving you enough? Are you liking this? Do you love this? Do you like this? Do you like this? C.S. Lewis said this about a fictional woman he was writing about. He said, she's the sort of woman who lives for others. You can tell the others by their haunted expression. So sometimes we, we go overboard either way. We're so selfish or we're so quote-unquote loving that we just, we, we just mess it up. But here's the truth. It's not about us. Real love is never about us. And that's one of the things that has to be rebooted in our hearts for us to live like Jesus lived, to love like Jesus loved, to live a love life, the kind of love life that Jesus wants us to live. It has to start by us letting him completely reboot us. 1 John 3.14. I'm sorry, let's say this out loud first. We must choose love every day. Everybody together. We must choose love every day. That's the bottom line. There's this first reboot when you first give your life to Jesus. And there's the daily one. We never get good enough at love. Love is an ongoing daily journey. We get reborn and filled with his Holy Spirit. But every day is a new chance to get rebooted, to get better at it. 1 John 3, 14. If we love our brothers and sisters who are believers, it proves that we have passed from death to life. But a person who has no love is still dead. Let's just listen. Let this sink over us as we watch. This isn't supposed to be condemning. This is hopefully convicting. It's the Holy Spirit telling us, hey, get better and you can at the same time. So now I'm giving you a new commandment. This is Jesus himself talking in this one. So now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other just as I have loved you. You should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. That's it. That's what's going to prove it. Or prove the other reality. 1 John 4, 17. And as we live in God, our love grows more perfect. So we will not be afraid on the day of judgment, but we can face him with confidence because we live like Jesus here in this world. Don't get distracted. The Israelites got distracted. Years later, they actually had saved that little bronze snake on a stick. They gave it a name. They called it Nahushtan. They, it became one of their idols that they worshipped instead of God. May we never worship love, quote unquote, that way. Our definition of love. However we want to define or redefine love. If we're going to follow Jesus, we've got to let him be the only authority, the only one who defines what a life of love means. Amen? Amen. That story, by the way, is in 2 Kings 18. It's an awesome story about rebooting. King Hezekiah came into power and he not only reinstituted all of the good stuff God had said to do, but he tore down all of the altars to the pagan gods, including all the altars to the pagan god Nahushtan. And it said at that moment he actually destroyed the snake and the stick after all those years. Just got rid of it. And I'm telling you, if you really want God to reboot you, that's always going to be part of the equation. That's part of the rebooting process. C.S. Lewis again, he says, courage is not simply one of the virtues, but the form of every virtue at the testing point. Let me read that one more time. That's very important. Courage is not simply one of the virtues, but the form of every virtue at the testing point. In other words, the minute that you choose to love, it's going to take courage. The minute that you choose to completely surrender to God for the first time, where every single day you surrender to him again, it's going to take courage. It's scary. It's hard. But it's possible with his help. Paul writes in Ephesians, live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He loved us and he offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. 
going to read that one one more time too. I love this first line. Live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. I could have just read that over and over for half an hour. That's really, the, that's really what it means to be rebooted. There's so much more, and I hope everything else I said clarified it and helped you understand it and apply it better than that. But this is it. We are rebooted to live a life of love and to follow the example of Jesus. And if you have the courage to let him do it in you, it, you can do it. Listen, it's, it, Paul also told Timothy, for God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power and love and self-discipline. Again, you can do it with his help. He doesn't just want to tweak you. He doesn't just want to help you back off a little bit from something you're wrong about. He wants to completely reboot you and completely re reboot me from scratch. And when that happens, it's miraculous. This morning, I'd like you to pray this prayer with me. Lord, I will let you reboot me. I'd like you to take just a minute and I'd like you to pray that. I'm going to clarify it a little bit. They're going to play some soft music, give you some space to just pray this prayer in. But I'd love for you to pray this to God. Literally use those words or find more meaningful words, but can you pray that truth to him? Lord, I will let you reboot me. Maybe for some of you, you've never given your life to Jesus ever. And so what, that, what you're saying is, okay, fine. I'm going to give you my life today. I'm going to repent. I'm going to be baptized. This is my life. There may be some other major decisions that God's leading you to do. Here's a couple if you can't think of them on your own. Lord, I will stop demanding this from this person that I say I love. Lord, I'm going to apologize to this person. By the way, you can write this down if you want. You've got the outline, the life group questions right in your hand. You can put it in your phone, write a reminder, set an alarm. I'm going to apologize to them at 3.33 this afternoon. Figure it out. Lord, I will forgive this person. I will stop justifying not loving this person. I will start showing Christ's love to this person or this group of people for the first time ever because I am asking you, God, today to reboot me. To make my love life be the kind of love life that Jesus lived, not the kind of selfish one that I've been taught to live by the world. Whatever that means to you as you pray that prayer with us, would you stand, would you sing? We're going to make these choices together today.